Peter. Um, I'm surprised you mentioned you got 10 cents a day in the camp. Did they actually give you cash or was it script and what did you do with it? The Japanese came well prepared in their invasion. They had occupational money for every country they, they were in. Oh it's uh, pretty much like monopoly money. <laughs> That's why the natives would trade you anything of intrinsic value for the occupational money. I, they didn't care if it was worn pair of socks. They would buy it because it's got some intrinsic value. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um Member Lester Fascio. Yes, ma'am. Trudy. My yeah. husband, yes. Oh, there she is. And so, I'm so proud to see you because my husband was a field guy. Yes. Yeah. All those years. He was with Group 5. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And he always said that he'd done this for his country and if he had to do it again, he would do it again. For what you went through to be an American and fight for your country. Well, my feeling is I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't take a million to do it again, <laughs> even if you gave me a guarantee that I'll come out. <laughs> Once is enough. <laughs> Go on to something new. It was three years ago when I overcame my evasion for the Koreans. The natural question's always been when you talk to someone, do you hate the Japanese? And we always say we don't. Because as far as we could see, they were doing the job that they were assigned to do to the best of their ability. Just as we were trying to do the job to the best of our ability. But the Korean guards, that's another story. And even when you understand, for instance, I understand the rationale behind the Korean behavior, but it doesn't distract from the fact that it still hurts. And the reason that they acted that way is because they're the lowest man on the totem pole. They've been colonized by the Japanese officially in 1910. The Koreans could not keep their own names. They could not keep their own culture. They were not allowed to speak Korean. So when they were inscripted or drafted into the Japanese army, they weren't trusted to be frontline troops. They weren't given auxiliary duties. So naturally, when you're put in that position, and you're low man on the totem pole in your system, and then you come across another system where you have POWs, there's no one lower than the POW. And the fact that even if I understand why the Koreans behaved the way they did, it took me until about three years ago to get over this feeling because they enjoyed what they were doing. The Japanese did it to maybe spur us on to get more work out of us. But the Korean guards, it was different. Their hatred was almost, it was animal hatred. There's no sense to it. As a Chinese, you've got a special treat in the camp, good or bad? Were you especially treated differently as a Chinese in the camps, good or bad? Well, I was saved by a sergeant by the name of Frank Fujita. He's half Japanese, but he looks all Japanese. He was treated the worst of all because the Japanese take the attitude that you're a Japanese regardless of where you're born in the world. You have dual citizenship. And Frank, being born in Abilene, would, would never admit to even being an American soldier. He was Texas. He was a Texan. 
then he might have a Japanese father. But yeah, he was tough. He had it the roughest. Me, it just depends on the soldier that I come up against. Once in a while, I would come across a Japanese soldier who has served in China. And then all he sees is a Chinese face. And then it just depends on how he feels that day, whether he got off on the wrong side of the bed or whether he's feeling fairly benevolent. So it's just the breaks of the game. You take it the way. I've been back twice, once in 69, once in 80. It is ironic because the first time when I went there and we, we hired a, a driver and a guide from uh, Bangkok and we drove up there and he was driving us around showing us the sights and I said stop here. And it was the point at which we would go from the main road down to the river where we would be loading and unloading barges. And I said, I want to go down to the river. And he looked at me and he said, you can't go to the river this way. I said, of course you can. So on the way, he asked one of the villagers, can we go get down to the river? And the villager said, yes. So when he got down to the edge of the river, he said, how did you know? I said, I used to work here. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean you used to work here? I said, there's more to being a prisoner of war than the bridge on the River Kwai. I said, I showed him where the Japanese headquarters was. I showed him where the camp was, that we had to dig a moat. That was, and then we started asking some of the older villagers where the you know, when they had filled in the moat. And that was when he realized, yes, this man has been here. But on the other hand, you, you can't knock the Siamese people for using it as a, as a way of generating revenue. Because you mentioned the bridge on the river quiet, and everybody knows what it is. And even though the movie was inaccurate, it was entertaining. <laughs>